Hi class, this is a lecture video on formal logic, I'm sorry, formal language and translation. Um, before we get into that, I'm going to just say a few caveats. Uh, first of all, I know this seems like a somewhat primitive setup uh, where you're just looking at uh, my writings, uh, but partially it's just because I don't like to waste and I have tons of extra notebook paper. Um, and so I'm just going this route instead of you know, trying to set up some large marker board or something. Uh, very generally, when we, when we have a lot of, say, problems or things to write down, uh, you'll see this type of lecture instead of, instead of the type where you see my face. Uh, I also know it's a tiny bit buzzy, and I don't know why. I'm sorry about that. I think it's something to do with the camera that Kent sent me. But hopefully it's not too bad. Um, so that's all I wanted to say on the format. Um, the more important points come with the content. Uh, and I really want to emphasize that, especially kind of starting today, the lectures just build and build. Uh, and so if you don't understand 1.3, you're not positioned to go to 1.4, you're not positioned to go to 1.5, etc., um, and so it's really important that you utilize your resources, um, that you are posting in the questions about the materials discussion boards if you have them, that you are working through all the practice problems in the textbook, uh, that you're looking at your classmates' posts uh, for the weekly exercises, etc. Uh, just, you know. Obviously, you can't look at those until after you've posted, but just reading through everyone's answers, I think, uh, would be helpful to really give you a lot more examples of what we're doing. So, those are just some things to bear in mind. Um, so, with all those caveats, uh, we're going to shift from uh, the operators that we talked about last time into turning that into a formal language uh, by, again, when I say formal language, think of something like mathematics and the symbols we use in mathematics and what they mean, etc. And really, that's all we're doing in uh, 1.3 and 1.4. We're introducing uh, that formal language. And so to do so, uh, let's get started. So we learned about conjunctions last time. The symbol we will use is the ampersand. And you do enough practice, you'll get very used to making ampersands. Um, and so that's just read as and. That's a conjunction. Um, then we have the wedge. Uh, the wedge is what we use for disjunction. And so again, we would read this as or. Uh, not either or. We'll get to either or in a bit. Um, if you, uh, I don't think that the Blackboard symbol recognition for discussion boards recognizes wedge, so you are perfectly uh, fine just using a capital V instead. We won't use a capital V for anything else. Uh, and then lastly is the tilde, which you have on your keyboard, uh, which is not. Uh, just for the record, there are a couple of other symbols that you might see, um, so I'll mention these. If you're moving on in uh, to do other other uh, activities in formal logic, uh, another thing you might see for an and is just a dot. Uh, it can be and. It's a dot in the middle, so it's not a period. So, A and B. Uh, or sometimes you'll see basically uh, what's sometimes called a carrot. It's just an upside-down wedge. That could mean and as well. Um, with negation, you'll sometimes just see the line, almost like the negative sign, uh, or a line with a little hook on the end. Uh, if, again, you're doing your assignments and something's not recognizing a tilde, this is fine to use. So, those are... Uh, the formal symbols 1.4 is going to introduce two more, uh, but for now, <coughs> I'm going to try to go in order. 
Uh, the next thing we will use, notice what I just did here, uh, capital letters, so A, B, C, etc. Don't use V, but A, B, C, etc. If it's a capital letter, it stands for uh, an atomic statement. Sorry, uh, I guess atomic statements we're using as simple statements in this text. So, uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. So, if you want to symbolize a simple statement, uh, remember from last lecture, statements have to be the kind of thing that are true or false. So, uh, I always have somebody make the mistake if they're trying to symbolize something like Mickey is tall. They'll try to use a different letter for Mickey and is tall. No, don't do that. So Mickey is tall would just be something like M. Uh, and then if I and did this with a curl uh, or tilde, it would say Mickey is not tall. And so uh, use your 1.2 lectures about... Um, simple versus atomic, and we're going to combine that with capital letters to basically be able to symbolize complex sentences. That's what we're working towards in uh, 1.5. So capital letters represent single atomic statements. How And so lowercase letters... B, C, uh, lowercase letters are representative of what are called sentence variables. They can stand for any sentence, uh, whether simple or otherwise. So, for instance, the letter, uh, if, if I just said A, could stand for M, and it is not the case that R or T. For instance, uh, and I would probably read through pretty carefully the, the footnote on page 18 about that stuff. Um, it really kind of explains in more detail what uh, lowercase sentence variables can stand for more specifically. So, That's the introduction. I'm going to switch pages here just because I'm a little, little messy. Um, what we're going to talk about next, we're still in 1.3, is uh, that we have these things called main connectives. <clears throat> so if I said Mickey is tall and bald, the example we used last time, we would say something like M. What's the atomic statement there? Mickey is tall. Then we might say B stands for Mickey is bald. So if I said Mickey is tall and bald, we might symbolize that as M and B. That's a well-formed formula. And in this case, the main connective, oh, I'm sorry, I used, <laughs> I used the wrong symbol. Uh, we might say M and B. Sorry, I've taught too many logic textbooks and used too many different symbols for conjunctions. Um, and so in this case, the main connective is an and. This whole statement is a conjunction. However, um, they don't have to be that simple because, again, uh, we're just talking about mimicking everyday life here. What if someone said, <coughs> sorry, what if someone said, Mickey is bald and not slender? Hurtful. Um, well, 
we might use B for Mickey is bald. We might use S for Mickey is slender, but we have a not. And so now it would be something like B ampersand tilde S for Mickey is bald and not slender. In this case, for reasons we'll see in 1.5, this is still the main connective. Um, but ultimately, we're going towards using the tools of the trade to be able to uh, symbolically represent any well-formed statement, simple or compound. And so that's the main thing we're up to in 1.3. It is worth mentioning, uh, if you look at the exercises, uh, you really want to pay attention to translation because that's something we're going to hit pretty hard in uh, the Unit 1 exam, which is pretty much just translation and truth tables. And so what you want to pay attention to is there's lots of just little tricks of the trade for translation. Um, for instance, there's other words that translate into ampersand. Yes, we have and, but also if you think about it, things like but are logically equivalent to and. If I said Mickey is bald but not slender, uh, that would be symbolized in the exact same way. And so really, maybe even keep like a little side, uh, just a page of all these little tricks and trades. <coughs> For instance, we already talked about, uh, well, if we're going to symbolize either A or B, so either Mickey is hefty or slender, <laughs> how do we symbolize either? We know we have, we have to say A or B, but what's the difference between this wedge, the inclusive wedge, and adding either and making it uh, the exclusive variety? Well, if you remember, <coughs> sorry, if you remember, um, Either A or B means one or the other, but not both. Well, we could do that because both is another way of saying and. And so we could go one or the other, but not both. Uh, I'm going to talk you through this here in a minute. So, uh, first of all, as Gustafson and Ulrich talk about, we need some parentheses. And I will say a little more in parentheses in a minute. Um, but that's what this says. This says one or the other, but is symbolized as and. And then notice, because I'm negating the parentheses, I'm not saying not A, I'm saying not both A and B. So anytime we have either A or B, that's your answer. And again, that's just the kind of thing you might want to have on your little cheat sheet for all these very common uses. Uh, so let's say just a little bit more on parentheses uh, before we move on to 1.4. I, I won't have a lot to say on 1.4 because it's basically just an extension of 1.3 with more symbols. So These two are different, just like in mathematics. So again, to draw an analogy, those, I my camera out of focus. Uh, those are going to get you different answers, right? Negative seven plus four is negative three. Negative seven plus four is negative eleven. What's the difference? This is negating just the 7. 
this is, uh, sorry, is flipping the sign of just the 7. This is flipping the sign of the sum total. Very similar thing here. This says not A and B. So Mickey is not slender and he is tall. That's true. Um, this is negating the and, uh, what you might think of as the main connective of the parentheses. And as such, it is saying not both A and B. Mickey is not both slender and tall. Um, and so uh, parentheses are a necessity, just like mathematics. They determine order of operations. And your statement is not well formed uh, without them as a rule. So that is not a well formed statement. Because I don't know if this is saying uh, A or B and C or a or B and C. Um, those are going, just like in mathematics, those are going to end up as very different answers a lot of times. Sometimes they'll coincidentally be the same. But I'll have a hamburger or tacos and a Pepsi. Uh, that might be something if you're deciding between two menu items. Whereas if you say, whereas if we switch down here, I'll either have a hamburger or a, a taco and a Pepsi. That sounds very different. Um, so in this case, you get the Pepsi with both of them. In this case, you get it with only the second option. Um, so that's why we need parentheses. Uh, I, I don't spend, and Gustus and Ulrich don't spend a ton of time on parentheses here because we could kind of work backwards. In the next uh, few chapters, we're going to start to learn how to essentially compute values of these types of things, uh, just like we compute values here. Uh, and it'll be pretty obvious if you're missing parentheses because you can't compute the value. So basically, if something is left ambiguous that I can't compute which way it goes, you know you're missing parentheses. Um, Gustus and Ulrich adopt a pretty standard convention that if you, theoretically, you could just use all parentheses. So you could have something like A and B or C and not D or M. Uh, if this is perfectly fine, and it's perfectly well formulated, but it's not really intro-friendly, and so they've adopted kind of a standard among logic texts where, well, the smallest unit is the parentheses, and then the next smallest unit is brackets. Oops. And then the next smallest unit uh, is called uh, set. So if you do this, uh, this actually tells you the order to compute in, because we always start with parentheses, then brackets, then set. So this will, uh, again, stuff like this with the parentheses and the bracket set, etc., is going to be important once we get to computing this stuff with truth tables. Um, so just get in the habit of, you know, get, uh, cultivating good habits, doing it the right way now so that later you don't get yourself in trouble. And that's about all I have to say about 1.3. Make sure you're, you know, reading the chapter carefully, doing the exercises, etc. Uh, 1.4 is going to be very brief by comparison because it's just introducing the last two symbols. Uh, the first is the material conditional. Which is 
symbolized as a horseshoe. Uh, you read that as if then. So if A then B. A is called the antecedent. B is called the consequent. Um, but order kind of matters here. Uh, believe it or not, if A then B, this is how you write it. But if you say A if B, you've actually switched the order. So you'd read A if B uh, would be symbolized as that. So Again, this one says if A then B. This one says A if B. And the most common problem with the conditionals is it's asymmetrical. It matters which one goes first, unlike conjunctions and disjunctions in some senses. So a good way to do that, I like to say stick to your comfy cases. Um, so think of something like if you're in Ohio, you're in the U.S. If I'm in Ohio, then I'm in the U.S. Oh, that means I got the right order. Whereas if I say A if B, uh, you'd say, well... I'm in Ohio if I'm in the U.S.? No, that's not right. That switches the order. And so just sticking to like a comfy case like that will really help with these translations in 1.4 to make sure you're going in the correct uh, direction with the material conditional. When is this true and when is this false? So we talked about the other three last video lecture. Uh, material conditionals are only false when A is true and B is false. So they're true every other time. So think of the example I just said. If I said, if I am in the U.S., I am in Ohio, when would that be false? Well, if I'm in the U.S., but I'm not in Ohio. Um, so that's when material conditionals are false. And... Um, Again, just be, be aware there's a bunch of different ways of saying things that are equivalent to this. Saying A if B changes the order, saying A only if B changes the order. Uh, be aware of things like that. Go to your comfy cases to make sure you're getting it the right order. If you're reading symbols to English, here's what I like to do to make it unambiguous. Um, So if I wrote something like that, and I wanted to switch it to English, how would I do that unambiguously? Uh, two tricks here. I'll always read uh, the first parenthesis as the case, or it is the case. That's how you, uh, when you're switching, well, I'll show you that. And then I will, instead of saying if A then B, I'll just say implies. Because then you don't have to worry about order. And so if you do it that way, you could just say, it is not the case that A implies B. Or A does not imply B. But that's more desirable than the alternative. For instance, if I just said, if someone read to me not A or B, I might mean that, or I might mean that. And so, if I say not the case that A or B, then it's very clear that I mean this. So, two cheap tricks for uh, converting symbols to English. Read the first parenthesis is the case. Read the horseshoe as implies to make sure you don't accidentally flip the order. Uh, last symbol is the by condition. Oh, sorry. Uh, and... Some other logic textbooks, you might see the horseshoe as an arrow instead, if you're going forward with computer, uh, what have you. might come up that way. If, if you want to do... Uh, if you're having trouble doing horseshoe while typing on the computer... There are a couple of other options available to you. I'm, I'm perfectly fine if you use the caret. So, uh, that is shift period. Uh, I'll read that as if A then B. 
if you're having trouble on the computer. And then lastly, we have triple bar. Oh, by the way, uh, just as an aside, your uh, Microsoft Word can do all these logic symbols. Um, if you know the shortcut keys, it's simply the, uh, the discussion board programs in Blackboard that might not have them all. So triple bar, you read that as A if and only if B. And what that means is either both are true or both are false. So I was not good at planning ahead when I was in college. And so it was true that I had an umbrella if and only if it was raining when I got dressed. Um, so it didn't occur to me to grab an umbrella if, if it was going to rain later. So what does that mean? Well... One of two cases, I had an umbrella and it was raining when I was getting dressed, or I didn't have an umbrella and it was not raining when I, when I got dressed. So either both are true or both are false. That's what a triple bar means. That's why it's called a biconditional. And that's why the order doesn't matter super much. And once more, Microsoft Word is perfectly capable of making triple bars, but if you're having trouble with that, uh, I am fine with uh, both carrots. Uh, probably the order doesn't even matter. <clears throat> so shift comma and shift dot. I'm fine with that. Because uh, triple bar is often also symbolized as two-sided arrow. So either one of those is. And so, again, either is fine if you are having trouble typing, but you want to type a triple bar, that is okay. All right. That's all I have to say about 1.4. Again, all you have to do is watch the translations to make sure you're getting the if-then orders right. Um, so we, I'm not going to do a whole lot of translation on this video right now. Uh, instead, we're going to practice that, and one, and we're going to spend a lot of our recitation time, uh, our our next recitation on the translation. So bring your translation questions, and we're going to do a lot of practice. Uh, I'll have you do some simple translations for your weekly exercises, um, but otherwise, I want to give you the tools to really kind of read through the uh, Ulrich Gustafsson a little more carefully before I enter into a lot of translation stuff. And so we will end the day there. I didn't say much about 1.5. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, um, but worth the read. See you next time.